Welcome to Millican Healthcare Compression Training Academy, a series of educational modules intended for healthcare professionals caring for patients with venous leg ulcers and complications of the lower limb requiring compression therapy. Welcome to Module 3, Compression Therapy in Practice. This module presents clinical implementation and practice considerations when using compression therapy. This module will explore ease of use considerations for compression therapy, ease of learning and cascade training, ease of selection, different application methods required for various compression materials, safety features used to assist correct application tension, bandage durability and wear time considerations, competency framework and training, certification, documentation requirements and resources available. In preparing this presentation, we have used and relied upon information from public sources on the web. We therefore make no warranty expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the underlying assumptions, estimates, data or other information not generated by Millikan. Compression therapy is considered gold standard treatment for the management of chronic venous insufficiency, venous reflux and associated conditions including edema, venous leg ulceration and skin conditions such as venous eczema. The goal of compression therapy is to support the underlying venous system and structures, aid venous competence to improve venous return, reduce limb edema, decrease pain and increase leg ulcer healing rate. Compression therapy will be required for life to prevent chronic venous insufficiency and symptoms of venous reflux from recurring. Module 1 of this education series contains in-depth information on the causes of chronic venous insufficiency, the venous system and its structures, the veins, the valve half muscle pump. Venous leg ulcers are a global healthcare challenge. The United Kingdom estimates prevalence between 0.1 and 0.3%. The United States of America, approximately 1.69%, with similar pre prevalence rates reported in parts of Europe. The annual cost of managing confirmed venous leg ulcers in the United Kingdom is reported to be between 500 and 900 million pounds. The United States of America estimate annual costs between 2.5 and 3.5 billion dollars and are consistent with European estimates with Germany reporting cost to treat at between 9,900 and 10,800 euros. These figures continue to be challenged. Erwin et al. in 2022 report lower costs in the United Kingdom through continual prevalence and reporting methodologies. The cost to the individual patient and impact on their quality of life is impossible to measure. Recurrence rates are reported to be between 26 and 69% at 12 months post-healing. There are a plethora of evidence-based policies and guidelines available which have been designed to establish a global consensus approach toward leg ulcer management and selection of compression therapy, including the International Advisory Panel for Compression, who published a pathway cited in the European Wound Management Association compression documents. For any compression therapy to be effective, it must first be accepted and tolerated by the patient and aim to enhance, not inhibit their quality of life. Patient desirables. This list is not exhausted and may include a good aesthetic appearance when, app appearance when applied, that it does not itch during wear, 
that it does not restrict a patient's mobility, their activity levels or lifestyle choices, that the applied compression resists odour, especially when wear time expectations can be up to seven days, that it is comfortable during wear, does not cause additional pain and discomfort, especially at night disrupting their sleep, that it does not slip down or unwind, but stays in place between applications, That it is cool and lightweight to wear, especially during the summer months and in warmer climates. Patients desire thee to look their normal self, to wear their own clothes and footwear and not have a bulky bandage on show. Many patients have stated that they do not want everyone to know they have a leg problem, which a bulky bandage can advertise. Characteristics a clinician may seek will be a combination of patient desirables and clinical considerations, including safety and ease of use. Accurate compression level is paramount for patient safety and for clinician reassurance that the desired compression level is achieved to prevent under or over compression leading to skin skin damage or worse. Innovative compression materials and manufacturing processes combined with the use of visual indicators increases accuracy and safety. Non-allergic. Where possible, compression materials should be free from any ingredient known to cause allergies, such as being free from latex. Comfort. The compression will be worn both day and night by the patient and it is therefore critical that they are comfortable, that the bandage does not impact on their sleep or increase pain levels. If compression becomes uncomfortable, it is at risk of being removed by the wearer and even resisted as an intervention in the future. Lightweight. Edematous limbs already feel heavy to the patients, so the bandage layers should be kept to a minimum to reduce additional material weight and be, breath- and be breathable to prevent further increased weight from excess wound fluids and general moisture. Low profile, to enable wearing of usual clothes and footwear, the patient is able to look and feel their more normal self. Easy to learn, easy to teach others and easy to select. Considerations here will include use of a kit rather than selection of components for safety and ease of use. The desire for easy selection so clinicians are not overwhelmed with too wide a selection of products. Having fewer and less complicated application techniques will reduce the potential for layer application error. It will also ease the onboard training of new colleagues. Compression should be conformable to aid ease of application and be able to adapt to a wide range of limb shapes and sizes and sizes affected by conditions such as edema. Inelastic or elastic. Ideally, that both are available for selection to deliver the most appropriate therapeutic resting and working pressures for your patient's needs. Sustained compression. Compression should and not lose applied pressure over time. Mechanisms such as cohesive bonding are used to sustain applied tension and prevent interlayer movement. Allow functionality. Compression should not restrict ankle movement or mobility and become counterproductive. That it should be non-slip to prevent bandage failure, skin damage, displacement edema and improve patient comfort and overall patient outcomes. There are many different types of compression delivery products available, including stockings, garments, inelastic Velcro devices, dynamic inflatable devices and compression bandages. In addition to patient acceptance and quality of life considerations, clinical efficacy, cost, implementation and ease of use considerations are fundamental. Clinical acceptability and ease of clinical implementation are key considerations for choosing any new compression system. This module will focus on considerations relating to compression bandages. 
Ideally, a compression bandage will be easy to learn. Compression bandage education and training is an ongoing process requiring specialist foundation training courses with regular competency attainment follow-up in order to safeguard patients. A compression bandage that is easily integrated into current approved leg ulcer and compression bandage education programmes, such as one that fits established recommendations and standards for the the desired millimetres of mercury pressure delivery, or being constructed of materials which fit with existing terminology, which are already understood and established in clinical practice, such as elastic long stretch, inelastic short stretch. This will afford academic programmes to accommodate new training material and practitioners to understand these technologies more readily. Should be easy to cascade train. Implementation of any new system or device can pose huge training challenges. Strategies will be required to maintain ongoing competency. Often due to the level of staff turnover, the time required to train and deem new staff members competent also needs to be considered. Easy to select. We should also consider the number of sizes that are available with any adopted range. Is it easy to choose or are there confusing additions such as versions in both latex and latex free within the same range and same sizes? Ideally, the best option would be latex free with no room for error. Is the millimetres of mercury pressure stated? Is there a choice? for venous or mixed etiology leg ulcers. The fewer size variants within a range, the easier and safer it will be to select. Is it easy to apply? The length of time available to apply compression during clinical appointments is often very limited. Ideally, we desire to apply fewer layers quickly and effectively. Through minimising the need for any additional conditional components under or over layers and reducing the use of tools such as tapes and scissors by minimising a very simple, not multiple technique application, avoiding the need for complicated adaptations such as excessive cutting or fold, ease of application will be achieved. Fundamentally, We want our compression bandage to be safe. Bandage safety is paramount. Compression strength should be stated and be easily identifiable. When applied, the bandages should aim to to achieve and sustain the desired millimetres of mercury pressure during wear. Safety management is supported by the use of visual indicators, application guides and underlying innovative technology. Sustainment of compression through cohesive layers which bond or adhere the layers to sustain the applied millimetres of mercury pressure. We want our systems to be durable and be able to achieve the wear expectation which is usually up to seven days. We want to be able to resist bandage failure, slippage and wind, even in younger, active leg ulcer patients. And finally, we want it to be easy to remove. Compression will ideally easily unwind or be able to undergo a single piece removal, even following seven days wear. For compression to be easy to learn and teach others, Ideally, it will be easy to explain. Bandage materials ideally should not be such overcomplicated technologies that they become too difficult to explain, explain to healthcare colleagues and should have the ability to blend where possible with established compression practice, categories, theories, recommendations such as the UMA compression position document and facilitate incorporation to taught course materials and competency frameworks. 
it should be easy to position against clinical needs. The level of millimetres of mercury pressure should be easily matched to the clinical indication being treated and offer clear ranges of millimetres of mercury pressure level, such as light compression, 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure, for patients with an underlying arterial insufficiency and standard or full 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure for venous leg ulcers with very very little or no underlying arterial insufficiency. A choice of bandage types that could be matched to the patient's skin condition, for instance, paste bandages such as zinc or calamine to manage skin conditions associated with chronic venous insufficiency, and also mobility status to consider the patient's ability to work with short stretch technology and those who require long stretch. Easy to select. Selecting compression bandage components does not need to be a daunting task. Many industries have now combined components into kit formats to aid ease of selection. Ideally, kit formats should have sufficient choice to meet clinical needs, but not have an over-comprehensive process to select the kit. Top-up items or too large a range which may potentially create confusion or lead to mistakes. It should be easy to apply, ideally to include safety features for correct application tension to achieve desired compression levels, such as visual indicators or guides, and not have overcomplicated application techniques or require a different application method for different layers of the system, potentially creating confusion and the potential risk of application error. Finally, it should be easy to remove. Compression should be easy to unwind or undergo a single piece removal, even if it has been worn for seven days. Module 1 discussed ankle brachial pressure index and its importance in the selection of compression therapy. The patient's underlying arterial status is the most important consideration when deciding to initiate compression therapy. An ankle brachial pressure index assessment must be completed to screen for the presence and severity of underlying arterial insufficiency. Failure to identify arterial disease prior to initiating compression therapy can lead to very serious consequences for the patient. Specific ankle brachial pressure index ranges are appropriate for light compression treatment and standard compression treatment. Light compression is indicated for patients with an ankle brachial pressure index value equal to or greater than 0.5 to less than 0.8 or those with mixed venous with an underlying arterial insufficiency. Standard compression is indicated for patients with an ankle brachial pressure index value equal to or greater than 0.8 to less than 1.3 or those with venous insufficiency with mild or no underlying arterial insufficiency. Compression therapy is measured in millimetres of mercury pressure. Light compression will fall between 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure and standard compression will fall between 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. Another key factor to consider is the patient's skin condition. Is the skin intact or is it irritated by conditions associated to chronic venous insufficiency, such as venous eczema? Activity level needs to be evaluated to understand if short or long stretch compression will be the most appropriate. Patient tolerance of compression can be managed with the use of light compression as a precursor to using standard compression and in those unable to tolerate standard compression. It is important to understand the indications for compression use and when compression is contraindicated. 
indications for compression use are for venous leg ulcers, where there is chronic venous insufficiency, where an ankle brachial pressure index is equal to or greater than 0.8, the patient can be for standard compression, 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. Mixed leg ulcers, where the patient has chronic venous insufficiency with an underlying arterial insufficiency, an ankle brachial pressure index, which is equal to or greater than 0.5, the patient can have light compression, 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure. In general, compression is indicated for active or healed leg ulcers, lower limb edema, lymphedema, the treatment of varicose veins, for tired, aching legs secondary to venous disease, to manage skin changes due to venous insufficiency and for the prevention and treatment of deep vein thrombosis, for instance, compression use during pregnancy. Contraindications for the use of compression include uncompensated organ failure, whether that be heart, liver, renal, advanced peripheral obstructive arterial disease, where an ankle brachial pressure index is less than 0.5 or greater than 1.3. Cellulitis or septic phlebitis, untreated wound infection, abscesses, advanced peripheral neuropathy. Compression should not be used. Ease of use considerations, compression selection. Ankle brachial pressure index assessment is fundamental to aid selection of the correct millimetres of mercury compression level. Ankle brachial pressure index has been covered extensively in previous modules within this series. Light or standard selection. This is required for patient safety. Despite there being disparity within the literature regarding ankle millimetres of mercury pressure levels of 20, 30 or 40, it is important that there is availability of a light or a lower compression for ABPI of 0.5 to 0.8 and standard or higher compression for an ABPI of 0.8 to 1.3. If light compression is used on a patient requiring standard compression, this has, this has the potential to delay edema reduction and healing outcome, thus extending the patient's suffering. If on the other hand a patient was treated with standard or higher compression instead of light, this could be potentially catastrophic and result in tissue or even limb loss. The level of millimetres of mercury pressure should be clearly identifiable on the packaging or within the pack insert and be positioned against the correct clinical indication for use. Selecting long stretch, short stretch or hybrid. Different types of compression give different, give different dynamic results on the limb. Working and resting pressures are covered extensively in module 2 of this series. Short stretch will generate peaks and trough pressures resulting in a squeeze and release effect as the calf muscle pump works with the resistance from the oblique. Long stretch has lower resistance and will generate more dampened pressure peaks generating a lower working pressure and a higher resting pressure. For hybrid type bandages, different manufacturers detail how their systems interact to deliver working and resting pressures and bandage stiffness. It is important to understand these properties and be able to select the correct compression dynamic for your patient's needs. Selecting products to address skin care needs. Having dry versions and moist or paste versions available that achieve the desired millimetres of mercury pressure are applied using usual techniques with the additional options for managing skin conditions related to chronic venous insufficiency such as the use of paste bandages including zinc and calamine are valuable selection options. Selecting kits or components, 
To improve the user experience and improve safety, many manufacturers have moved towards a kit-based offering. offering. This takes away the risk of component selection error. We should also consider any additional components and materials adding to cost, time to apply, error potential in selection and application. Range that's available within the selected compression. There are many compression bandage components and kits available on the market. Some available in one size only and some for different ankle sizes, often making range selection more complicated, hiring adapted application techniques to achieve desired compression on different size limbs. Module 2 explores Laplace law in depth and discusses how some newer compression innovations do not directly relate to this law and predicted sub-bandage pressure, pressures. Latex and latex free. Ideally, a complete range will be latex free to avoid any user error. Some bandage manufacturers do offer latex and latex free versions, which can be difficult to distinguish between and risk management will be required. Single use or washable. Most compression bandages, including kits, are single patient use. However, some bandages, particularly cotton short stretch, are washable. Washable bandages require frequent changes with additional under and over layers, so it is questionable if it is the most cost-effective approach, and there is very little clinical control over the correct washing and drying and maintenance of the desired compression. Durability and wear. wear. When aiming for a bandage system to be worn for up to seven days, we need to select robust compression materials, particularly with active patients. Cohesive compression is selected to prevent interlayer movement, resist slip and bandage failure. Ease of application considerations include the number of layers to be applied. This will not only impact material costs, but also the length of time allocated per patient clinical appointment. If, for example, four layers are to be applied rather than two, two layers, under layers and cover layers such as cotton tubular liners or stockings, if required, will also need to be taken into consideration in terms of cost, time to apply, warmth and bulk for the patient. The number of different application techniques. Some systems require different application techniques for each component. For example, one layer spiral and another layer figure of eight or, or pleated technique. Adaptations in technique for smaller or larger limbs. For example, 50% overlap or two thirds overlap or a reverse spiral application technique. It is critically important that the manufacturer's recommendations for application are read, understood and followed to achieve desired compression outcomes. There has also been much debate in the literature regarding the application of compression to the, to the dorsal of the foot and toes. We must always consider compression for all areas at risk of swelling, edema, and where possible, have access to material widths to allow us to compress these areas. Limb shape normalisation. This has been subject to much, much debate in the literature relating to graduated compression, the belief that by building a normal limb shape with the first layer will ensure graduated compression. There are many reasons you may wish to normalise limb shape for a patient which may include for aesthetic appearance. The patient wishes their leg to appear normal or their usual shape. With many newer innovative compression materials and systems, the need to build a limb shape for compression purposes is not required as the compression behaves differently. The main purpose of layer one, so known as the comfort layer, is that of protection, especially over bony prominences or fragile wounds. 
Our aim is to achieve a smooth foundation to receive the compression being applied over this layer. Most layer one components are wool, synthetic fiber, foam type materials and do not contain any compression. But some newly developed materials do contain compression in layer one. So it is important to understand the material properties for each component. For patients with multiple skin conditions relating to chronic venous insufficiency, it may be necessary to deliver a paste bandage layer, such as a zinc or a calamine, which traditionally have not been seen as materials for normalising or building limb shape, and traditionally required a wool layer applied over. Newer innovations in this area have also addressed this need through foam layers infused with zinc or calamine. Conformability of bandage materials is a key consideration, especially for areas such as the back of the heel to ensure a smooth application to prevent bandage bulk creating pressure, spots and tissue damage. Some bandage materials are higher profile and non-conformable, requiring cutting or folding techniques to achieve the smooth application beneath the compression. Some considerations here are time to apply, safety for skin integrity and difficult difficult application. Safety features such as visual guides or indicators have become increasingly popular to ensure ease of use relating to correct application tension. Cohesive bandages are considered easier to use as they do not require secondary tapes or fixation and will also increase the durability of the applied bandage during wear. Bonding the compression materials, preventing interlayer movement and consequently preventing bandage slippage and failure. Removal techniques have also evolved to include one piece, one piece removal, reduce time, reduce mess, or a simple unwind technique. Kits versus components. Compression kits are designed and manufactured to be safe, convenient and time-saving versus the gathering of several components, underlayers, overlayers and tapes. Compression kits are con- Once the correct kit has been selected, the materials contained within achieve the desired compression, reducing the risk of material selection error. Clinical settings are often extremely busy places with limited time allocated per patient. A component could easily be selected in error. Safety features such as visual indicators or measured compression materials. Material compatibility. The cohesion or bonding of materials is very important. When using kit formats, the materials materials have been specifically developed and designed to work together. For example, a moisture resistant cohesive to be used with a paste, zinc or calamine kit. Speed of use. Again, time allocated per patient is critical. Ideally, we really we strive to quickly select and apply our bandage materials. Clinical effectiveness. Another consideration is that all data and clinical evidence relates to the pre-selected materials with the kit. Cost effectiveness. There is a predetermined cost outlay which does not require any additional material component costs. Ease of application, additional considerations for the number of layers. Patient implications. If several layers of bandage materials are applied to the patient's limb, this can become restrictive, hot, bulky and severely affect their quality of life. Therefore, we should aim to apply the least restrictive, most comfortable and conformable, lowest profile, lightest weight, fewest number of layers as possible to the patient's limb. Clinician implications. Clinicians are required to gain competence in each each layer and each technique of any bandage system. Time to learn. Fewer layers will significantly reduce the time required to train any new staff. Time to apply. 
clinic appointment times may be reduced significantly if fewer layers applied and additional under overlayers. Techniques deployed. A consistent application technique for all bandage layers is often not feasible with many compression bandage systems. To aid ease of application and improve safety, the least techniques and bandage adaptations, the better. Conformability. Some bandage materials are higher profile and as such are not as conformable to some of the areas of the lower limb, such as around the ankle area, often requiring folding or cutting techniques. To aid ease of application, it is advisable to work with lower profile conformable materials. Layer interactions. An important consideration is that of the interaction between applied layers. We aim to avoid movement beneath layers, which, which may create hot spots and potential skin damage. A good example is that of a cotton liner with an orthopedic wool, with a crepe bandage over the top of it, a non-cohesive compression covered with a cohesive compression, and then maybe an overlayer. That would be a total of six layers. The cotton liner has the potential to slip against the skin. The wool layer may slip between two layers. The crepe and the non-cohesive bandage may also slip. The cohesive bandage will remain intact against the under compression layer, but everything beneath it has the potential to move. Ideally, we want to use systems that do not require under or over cotton layers and cohere to each other to prevent any interbandage layer movement. Time to remove. Nursing and clinic time can be reduced if there are two layers to remove rather than the six layer example given above. Cost implications. For each additional layer we introduce, we introduce additional costs to the treatment package being deployed. Consider the cost of single bandage components versus the cost of a compression kit. And do not consider all of the material costs involved and nursing and clinical time savings. Ease of application, limb shape, normalisation and protection. The importance of laying the correct foundation for compression to be applied has been touched on in the previous slide regarding interactions between the foundation layer and materials being applied over. The overall aim of the foundation layer, also known as the comfort layer, is that of protection. But for many decades we have deployed techniques to build up the limb relating to the law of Laplace. This has been explored extensively during module 2 of this series. As previously, as previously mentioned, this is not necessary with newer innovative compression materials. We will discuss some additional reasons for normalising limb shape and providing additional comfort layer to different limb shapes and scenarios. Materials should easily conform, maintain in place without creating bulk and risk of additional pressure points, putting skin integrity at risk. The foundation layer or comfort layer can be used to normalise the shape of the limb in certain scenarios which we will discuss shortly. However, we must remember that normalisation may purely be aesthetic for the patient to have an appearance of a normal limb shape rather than to be anything which affects the sub-bandage pressure level. Limb shapes. A champagne-shaped limb. The patient will present with a larger edematous ankle area and a smaller upper gaiter and calf area. By applying additional foundation layer to the upper gaiter and calf area, the limb shape will appear more normalised and offer a smooth and consistent foundation for the compression for the compression to be evenly and easily applied. An inverted champagne shape as illustrated. The patient will present with a small ankle area with edema concentrated around the upper gaiter and calf area. 
In this case, additional foundation will be applied to the smaller ankle area. This will give the appearance of a normalised limb shape and ease the application of the compression layer over a more evenly distribution transition area from the ankle to the gaiter area. Displacement edema, not, not exclusive to but very commonly seen above the bandage height, so the knee and above. The limb will require above knee compression to resolve this and the foundation layer will play a crucial role in normalising the shape on the transition area from the reduced below knee to the edematous above knee. Aprons and folds can be protected above and beneath with foundation layer materials which are sufficiently low profile and conformable. This is a key consideration when selecting materials you are going to work with. Vulnerable skin areas and bony prominences. Additional foundation layer can be applied over bony prominences such as the tibial crest or the malleolus to add additional skin protection. Ideally, a foundation layer should not require any underlayer which may slip beneath. It should have the ability to gently hold against the skin to prevent bandage slip. It should be low profile and conformable. Ease of application considerations will include Probably the most key consideration is does the compression correlate with academic training courses, practice policies and guidelines within the specialist field to aid adoption and safe practice? Can the compression be incorporated within core skills and competence attainment frameworks? Time to apply. Are there time saving qualities or do time cost implications exist? The number of techniques that we need to use. This will impact ease of application, ease of training. We will explore some different application techniques shortly. The number of combinations of techniques that we have to use. Safety issues, risk of error, ease of application and training considerations must all be weighed up. Modifications. Should we consider avoiding complicated adaptations and modifications? These may impact heavily on ease of application and ease of adoption training. Ability to cut. Are the materials cuttable? Do they fray? Are there materials, ava materials available which avoid the need to cut and aid ease of application? Safety features. Visual aids to guide the application tension and support ease of training, competency attainment. Consider the benefits and type of indicators to be used. We will explore some, some different application techniques over the next few slides. The spiral application technique. The spiral technique is established as the most commonly used and easiest technique to learn and teach others. The spiral technique is used in most compression applications on its own or in combination with other we'll cover shortly. Traditionally, a 50% overlap is used, but we also need to be aware of some newer materials which require adaptation to the overlap level for larger limbs. We will look at some of these materials in more depth shortly. Application tension is gen generally defined by the bandage type, short stretch, long stretch considerations, and some newly developed bandage materials have the elastic or inelastic tension set within the bandage material. It is important to understand the properties within the bandage and always follow the, manufa the manufacturer's recommendations for application. Correct level of bandage overlap and correct bandage tension is crucial when using the spiral technique. Visual indicators. Not all compression bandages contain application visual indicators, but they have become increasingly popular with clinicians. They are used as an additional application safety benefit and also as a teaching tool when training others. Material properties and bandage durability. 
Consideration for how the bandage material will stay in place once applied in a spiral technique, especially if we are expecting a bandage wear time of up to seven days, particularly in active patients. Materials which are cohesive bond the layers, prevent the interbandage movement and prevent slip. These are key considerations for the durability using the spiral technique. However, non-cohesive bandages may require other techniques such as a combined figure of eight or an additional reverse spiral purely to ensure that the bandage stays in place. We will look at these application methods shortly. The figure of eight application technique. As the image demonstrates, the figure of eight technique is routinely used at the heel and ankle area in compression bandaging. The figure of eight provides heel coverage and the ankle area with sufficient compression to manage any edema and to prevent displacement edema from occurring. If the compression level in this area was reduced, then edema may occur at the ankle. The number of figure of eight turns. We need to be aware that there may be one, two, two or even three plus figure of eights applied at this area, depending on the compression system you're using. Always follow the manufacturer's recommendations for the number of ankle figure of eights. Some bandage systems, you may be advised to apply additional figure of eights in certain scenarios, such as a severe champagne shaped limb. The figure of eight technique is easy to learn and easy to train others. Some compression systems require a figure of eight technique for the complete limb for one component, such as layer three in a traditional four layer compression system. The correct 50% overlapped the correct bandage tension and correct figure of eight crossover technique are all required to ensure that the compression has been delivered to the limb in a consistent and evenly distributed manner. It goes without saying that the full limb figure of eight technique is more time consuming to apply than a simple spiral technique. Material properties define durability as discussed around cohesion previously. The full limb figure of eight technique is deployed in bandage materials which are not cohesive with an aim of the crossover figure of eight being to prevent bandage movement and slip to improve bandage durability and wear. The reverse spiral application technique. This is a more advanced spiral technique to learn and train others. It's often used in non-cohesive short stretch compression bandage applications. Its aim is to achieve a greater compression bandage stiff and the reverse technique is often used to resist bandage slip. Both spiral applications are applied at 50% overlap. The first compression layer is applied in a simple spiral to the full limb with a figure of eight at the heel ankle area. The second layer is then applied over the first layer but in a reverse spiral application from the ankle upwards so not recovering the foot heel area with the second spiral layer. The band has to be reversed for the second layer. This is often the most challenging part for clinicians to master and can increase application time considerably. Material properties somewhat define its durability. Bandage durability is also affected by the fixation method. method. So cotton type short stretch bandages with a metal clip and elastic fastening or taped fastening or semi-cohesive or weave cohesive bandage types. The wear time expectation will ultimately define what we choose to use on our patients. Application differences for hybrid technologies. As compression technologies have evolved, new concepts such as hybrid compression kit versions have also become available. Considerations for these may include 
The innovations may be out of scope for our current core training, skills and standards and may require some adaptations. These will evolve over time through position documents and international guidelines. Combinations of long and short stretch materials may have limited evidence base. The current evidence for the new innovations may be directly from or supported by the developers. We should also consider if the hybrid really is something new. The original Unaboot, for instance, is effectively a hybrid system. The paste in inextensible gauze layer becomes further stiffened or inelastic and the traditional outer compression layer is an elastic cohesive bandage. Overlap of the hybrid system is 50% or two thirds based upon limb size. New ways of applying these technologies mean that we must always follow the manufacturer's recommendations for use. A key difference with these systems is that 80% of the compression is in layer one, the comfort layer. Our first consideration is safety as these are the first innovations to have the compression in the first layer. It is crucial that we understand the layer's properties and apply as directed. 20% of the compression is contained in layer 2. Traditionally, we use more care to apply this layer due to the compression, but in this instance it delivers the lowest level of compression within this compression kit. Visual aids. There are new types of visual aids with central points and circles. We must be aware how to use these, how they work and the markers for each limb type. Visual guides. There are several visual guides or indicators incorporated to compression bandages. Examples being ovals to circles, rectangles to squares, some with central overlap points and lines. It is important that you are aware of the manufacturer's recommendations and follow their instructions as some offer more than one way of utilising the indicators and failure to follow this could lead to either under or over compression to the limb. An example being the 50% overlap midpoint point and two thirds overlap for the larger limbs with some compression systems. Ideally, we want visual indicators that are simple and safe to use. Preventing bandage damage. Bandage induced pressure damage. This presents as redness over a bony prominence, blistering, abrasions, broken skin areas and even skin necrosis. Areas at higher risk of pressure damage include the dorsal of the foot, around the ankle, around an ankle deformity, over crowded or deformed toes and over bunions. Higher risk areas will also include fragile skin and fragile wound areas. Preventing bandage induced pressure damage. We must attain specialist training and competence in every compression material we use routinely in practice. They are not all the same. Always follow the manufacturer's guidelines and request training and educational support materials from the bandage providers to support the safe and effective, safe and effective use of their products. Never use products prior to training competency attainment and sign off. Select products with safety features such as measured compression set within the materials and application tension guides to prevent over compressing of the limb. Pressing of the limb. limb positioning during application is crucial. The 90 degree angle or toes to nose to prevent the dorsal skin damage as seen here in the image on the slide. This patient has developed bandage damage. The compression was applied with the foot in the incorrect position and the folds created upon standing have now caused pressure ridges on the dorsal of the foot. Apply additional protection layer to areas at higher risk of skin and pressure damage. Ensure compression is smoothly and evenly applied and cannot slip beneath the compression. Fact 
factors affecting durability and wear time, slippage. Bandage slippage is the most common cause of bandage failure. As we have already discussed, cohesive bonding of compression materials and newer generation comfort layers and resist slippage increase durability and wear time. Slippage will lead to complete bandage failure, poorer patient outcomes, potential for additional wounds, increased clinic visits, increased clinical costs and material costs. Bandage can also lead to patient fall injuries, poor healing outcomes as not receiving the compression the patient can be distressed and become isolated at the fear of this prospect. As previously discussed, inner layer slippage leads to uneven pressure distribution, distribution, resulting in pressure hot spots and potential skin damage. Displacement edema. Edema will appear above the slippage height, often termed muffin topped. This will require skill to reverse. Edema can appear above, below or in between slipped bandage. The image shows gaps in the slip bandage where edema will appear in those windows. Initial edema reduction. When compression is initiated, it is recommended to change at least twice weekly for the first two weeks to avoid slippage. This is during the time the edema level reduction is at its highest level. Once the edema reduction has stabilised, the bandage wear time should be extended. Training competency frameworks. There is no international standard for this and it does differ from country to country and even at local policy level. So please know what is required for your area of practice. For most countries, including the UK and EU, all clinicians must complete a leg ulcer management course before practicing compression therapy. This usually involves, at a minimum, a three to five day course up to a year plus postgraduate leg ulcer management course. All all clinicians must complete product and application training for each compression type used within their area of practice. All clinicians must be signed as competent. Training and competency frequency are as per local policy and guideline. Manufacturers will support train competency assessment field documents. You will be deemed competent when you can one, describe fully the compression properties, two, explain and demonstrate safe selection, explain contraindications for use and demonstrate a safe application. Usually five to six observed clinical applications are undertaken for a lead nurse to sign off a trainee as competent. Again, this will differ from country to country. Please contact your local Millican Healthcare representative for access to our competency framework document and other supportive materials we have available to assist you with training and competence attainment. Millican Healthcare Clinical Nurse Specialist Team are all registered or certified nurses able to provide training, competency attainment support and provide practitioner signed certificates. Please reach out to your local contact for further information and support. Thank you for completing Module 3, Compression Therapy in Practice of the Millican Healthcare Compression Training Academy. There are five additional modules in the Compression Academy series. Module 1, Leg Ulcers and Conditions Affecting the Lower Limb, Lower Limb Physiology, Assessment, Investigation and Venous Leg Ulcer Differential Diagnosis. Module 2, Understanding Compression Therapy, explores how compression works, the theory and science of compression, compression types, characteristics of an ideal compression system, selection of compression and patient benefits. Module 4, Wound Management Principles with Compression, explores best practice skin care, wound care, 
extra date management, infection management and prevention strategies combined with compression therapy. Module 5 supports home care practice, patient information and patient care advice materials for looking after compression at home, preventing recurrence, skin management, diet, exercise and compression hosiery. Module 6 provides clinical evidence summaries to support your compression practice and on how to set up and run a clinical evaluation with a data template example.